This is a sermon from Cornerstone Church in Kingston. We're delighted to make these resources available for you and hope that you enjoy the ministry of God's Word today. There are lots of other resources on our website which we are pleased to make available and you can browse our website and download sermons and podcasts, read blogs and articles. And if you've been listening for a while and you would like to get to know the church or for us to get to know you a bit, there is an e-contact card, a welcome card that you can fill in on our website and we'd love to hear from you. We're taking a short break in our Psalms Songs of Ascent series. Ben will explain a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but we are going to read this, um, Isaiah 46. Baal bows down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together. Unable to rescue the burden, they themselves go off into captivity. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and grey hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you, I will sustain you and I will rescue you. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it in its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are now far from my righteousness, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. Okay, well, good evening from me. My name is Ben, Um, one of the uh, pastors here at the church. Um, Good to have you if you're new or visiting. Um, or if you're joining online, it's good to have you tuning in. There is an, an official line on why we're in Isaiah tonight, taking a break from um, uh, the Songs of Ascent, and that official line is this. <laughs> I'll give you the candid line later if you come up and ask me. But the official line is, we've been celebrating our 20th anniversary as a church. We had a special day yesterday. We had a great time together. This morning we had a fantastic uh, guest preacher, uh, and in the theme of taking sort of a pause from our normal program, we are taking a week out in Isaiah. That's the official line. <laughs> If you want the uh, candid line, uh, you can ask me later. Um, but, 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 but it's great. It's fantastic. What, what an amazing passage, actually. So many incredible things God says to us here in this, uh, in this chapter. So let's pray. Let's ask for the Lord's help, um, that he blesses us with his word, that he feeds us, that he exposes sin in us, uh, and that he shows us Christ uh, and heals our, our, our wounds uh, by looking at him and knowing him. So let's pray that. Father, we thank you so much for your word, that you are a God who speaks, and as you speak, you breathe life. Um, I pray, please, that your Holy Spirit would help us now to have eyes to see um, the truth of this uh, chapter, um, the things that you want to deal in our hearts with, um, the things you want to show us about Christ, uh, and and give us hearts uh, that long for Jesus and love him. 
uh, as the kind king that we heard about this morning. Uh, so please help us now, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure if it was mentioned last week, but a few weeks ago, uh, Rory mentioned uh, Race Across the World, this TV show. I don't know if anyone's been watching it. Um, yeah, Kerry has been having it on repeat. Uh, she's doing this thing where she's, I think season three is coming out, and it's like every week there's a new episode. So she's doing this thing where she's watching season two, sort of back to back, and then waiting for the s- season three. She's in season three, and then she's back to season two, carrying on, waiting for the next episode. Of se- so sometimes I'm like, who am I watching here? You know, are, are they going to cross Canada or somewhere else? And um, anyway, race across the world. Uh, the premise is uh, these people are sort of teamed up in couples, and they're trying to get, uh, you know, other side of the world as quickly as possible on, li- on a limited budget. And it's very fractious uh, because people are in these tense, tough situations. They have to make split-second decisions. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure. And what you see is cracks start emerging in the character of these people. We know that, don't we? Uh, when we're in positions of stress and difficulty, we crack and Cracks that were always there, but kind of hidden politely behind our nice social exterior, suddenly get blast open. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen those amazing uh, ball structure things that you see in toy shops that are like um, cages, and you throw them up in the air and they expand like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And then you catch them and they, they sort of crumple down again. Well, that's what happens to us when, when we come under pressure. We're like that ball, and all of our little sort of gaps and cracks explode open. And you can see what you're like sort of on the inside. And having a baby <laughs> is an amazing <laughs> moment uh, where you see, oh my goodness, I thought I had dealt with that. But it's huge. It's absolutely massive. So I don't know what you think about me. I don't know whether you think I'm a nice person. <laughs> I know I've only met some of you a couple of times. I know some of you know me a bit better. Um, I can tell you there is a limit to my niceness. <laughs> yeah? I'm very good at being very sort of polite and nice and smiley, but I have learned that there is actually a limit to my niceness. Um, I'm sort of sad to say, um, because, you know, the first time that Kerry is, is, is sitting down feeding Elodie uh, and asks me to, oh, Ben, can you just get me that? And I'm like, yes, darling, I will lay my life down for you. <laughs> I will go and get that thing. And I go and get the thing and I bring it back. And then she's like, oh, can you also get this? And I'm like, yes, darling. I will lay my life down for you. And I get up and get that thing. And then the third time, I'm like, yes, darling. (laughs) I will lay my life down for you. And I'll get, and then the fourth time, my heart starts thinking, surely I've laid my life down enough. (laughs) Isn't my life just on the floor? (laughs) And so what I've learned actually is my heart doesn't actually really believe what God says. It's quite shocking. I thought I did in my head. I I know in my head, I hear God's word, I hear what he says to me, and I go, I I agree with that, Lord, I believe it. You know, when Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive, I I hear that and I agree with it. But actually, what my heart says is, is no, that's the wrong way around. Jesus got that wrong. It's way better to receive than to give, surely. So I have realized uh, I have the idol of self, and that's been very clear to me um, as I've been under this new pressure of having a newborn. I, I've seen that really the God uh, that will rescue me and satisfy my heart, what, my, what my, my sinful heart says, is myself. That's what my heart has shown me. So, you know, when I'm gladly serving in the temple of self, and I'm a, I'm a priest in my own temple of self, and I'm trying to get my football team ready for my fantasy team, and Kerry asked me to do something again, I think, surely I've done enough here. Surely, you know, surely I've laid my life down. Enough. So that's what it's been for me. It's been very interesting as, as a Christian. When these moments happen in your life, you get to look at yourself and you say, whoa, hey, I thought I dealt with that. That's much bigger in my heart than I thought it was. So that's, that's what it's been for me recently. But I wonder, what is it for you? What pressure in your life is exposing those cracks in your heart? Is it maybe a stable future? I just want control over my future and, and, and pressure has come on my life. My future is now uncertain. And whoa, suddenly... I see this massive crack in my heart. Or, or worldly success. Maybe you've got um, a friend or someone you know who's just absolutely boss in life at the moment. I've got a friend who at uni was like, this guy, if he's gonna, what is he going to do in his life? He's going to sort of trundle along. And, and now he's literally playing gigs in front of thousands of people. And you look at him online and you go, wow, mate, you've made it. 
I'm, I could count the heads in here. Compared to 7,000 people that he's got. Wow, success. Oh my goodness. Maybe a happy marriage. Maybe is your marriage not as happy as you thought it was? That's the pressure. Maybe your children, you hoped so many things for them. I'm right at the beginning of my journey, so I'm not disappointed yet. <laughs> Elizabeth he hasn't let me down once yet, except for pooing all over my lap at a wedding uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> but an idol is anything that we look to, aside from God, as our foundation of joy, happiness, security, hope, or even justice. And if you want to know what temple you serve in, you know, what idol do you have? What cracks have you got in your life? I think there's, a, there's quite a simple test. And the simple test is this. When was the last time you felt a sense of injustice against yourself? And I, and I don't mean, you know, genuine sort of uh, abuse or neglect. You know, put those things to a side where someone's genuinely hurt you. But when was the last time in the normal course of life, you're just getting on, something happens which shouldn't, but enrages you because you feel like you're in, you're in the temple of, of yourself. <laughs> you're trying to do something. And someone's come and demanded something of you where you have to put it down. When was the last time you felt, hang on a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Finish this sentence for me. I deserve, what do you deserve? Or I have a right to, wait, wait, no, no, five more minutes. I have a right to. That's the temple that you worship in. And there's a major problem with idols. There's a major problem with these idols and these cracks that appear in our heart because what we see is that these idols that we look to for a sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, joy, they don't deliver. So me sitting down thinking, oh, I wish Kerry wouldn't ask me to get up one more time because then I would be happy is wrong. That idol doesn't deliver. And God in his great love for us shows us that in this passage. That's what he shows us really clearly. That's what this chapter of Isaiah all, is all about. It's about the foolishness of idolatry. And it's about what God says to us, uh, to, to us through it. So look at verse 5. He says, with whom will you compare me? Where else are you going to look for fulfillment, satisfaction, and peace? Ben, do you honestly think that getting your fantasy football team is going to be perfect and getting the highest score in the Cornerstone Football League, which I think, by the way, Chris Bradshaw is leading at the moment. Do you honestly think beating Chris Bradshaw at Fantasy Football League is going to make you happy, is going to satisfy you, is going to give you meaning and contentment and peace? Well, maybe a little bit. (laughs) But it won't. Fantasy football is a false idol. No. Okay, so, a bit of context for this passage here uh, in chapter 46. Bell and uh, Nebu. Um, Great great names, aren't they? Um, They were the premier gods of the premier nation on earth at the time. So Babylon was this amazing uh, nation, nothing else in the whole world like it. And their premier gods were Bel and Nebo. So Bel, is, it means Lord, it's where Baal comes from. And Nebo was interesting, he, he was like a word, interestingly enough. He was like the god scribe, he was the god who um, created writing, and he acted as like a prophet an interpreter for Bell to the nations. So you've got this kind of pseudo lord and word uh, in Babylon, which is interesting. These are the premier gods of the day. And together, a- as they operated together, they were like the gods of order and destiny. So if you wanted good crops, you would pray to Bell and to Nebo. If you wanted a happy marriage and lots of children, you would pray to Bell and to Nebo. If you wanted to control your life, you know, whatever idol you had in your heart wanted to achieve, whatever you thought would satisfy you, you would pray to them and they would give it to you. That's the idea. So what God does here in this chapter is he takes the two greatest idols on earth as an example for all other idols, whatever they may be, and he's going to preach to us, show us how pathetic they are, how they don't fulfill our desires, and then really what does fulfill our, our desires. And um, I've got three points tonight. The first one is listen. You see that in verse three? Listen. The second one is remember in verse eight. And the third one is listen in verse 12. Listen, remember, listen. And the first point is listen. God carries you. God carries you. There's a really um, stark contrast here in this chapter between what God does and what idols do. I wonder if you noticed it as we were reading. Because in verse 1, we see Bel bows down, 
Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. So this is kind of foretelling what's going to happen to these idols. God is saying even you know, as grand as they are, as high as they're raised up, they're going to bow down low. And he's actually foretelling what's going to happen in the future. They're going to be brought down, these idols, and they're going to be carried off by beasts of burden. So they're going to be physically carried away, these idols. And they're heavy loads. They're borne by beasts of burden. You can't carry these statues and these idols away yourself. You can't just have a couple of blokes say, yeah, come on, give me a hand with Bell. Let's take him away. They have to be dragged away and pulled away by beasts of burden. So they're heavy, these idols. They're heavy physically, but also spiritually. If you look at the second half of verse 1, the images that are carried about are burdensome. They're a burden for the weary. That's ultimately what idols do. They stand up and look pretty. They promise you freedom. They promise you liberation. They promise you joy and contentment. But in the end, they don't fulfill, and they're actually a burden for the weary. They crush you. They pin you down. So when money is our idol, you just are enslaved to work, aren't you? I just want a bit more money. Okay, I'm going to get a second job. I just want a bit more money. Okay, I'm going to kick that person out of the way so I can get a promotion. I want a bit more money, so I'm going to go gambling. That idol crushes and weighs upon you. When popularity or self-image is your idol, that's crushing, isn't it? It's exhausting keeping up an appearance, trying to look the best on social media, trying to uh, present yourself perfectly all the time. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I think, on, I think it's on ITV, there's this I Am TV, s- TV series. There's one called I Am Victoria. It's just exhausting to watch. There's a woman who's just obsessed with her image and how her kids dress and how her house is and how people outside see her and her makeup and her hair. And what food she cooks for guests who come to... It's exhausting to watch. That idol in her life is just crushing. It doesn't bring her freedom. It's crushing. What about success? I've already told you about my friend. (laughs) He's got 7,000 people watching him. Amazing. If if that's an idol, it crushes you because 7,000 is not enough. I want 70,000. The things that we thought would satisfy us and bring us rest, are actually they're a burden and they make us weary. Now here's the difference with God. Here's the really amazing stark contrast that this, that this, that this chapter is just beautiful at painting. Notice the difference with God. Look at verse 3. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob. Remember, uh, these idols are carried and they're burdensome. This is what God says. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs. I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you. And I will rescue you. Yeah, do you see? An idol is a lifelong burden that has to be carried. God is the lifelong burden bearer who carries you. Amazing difference. Maybe you come across the the, the poem Footprints in the Sand. Have you come across that one? Uh, Sort of a quite famous Christian poem. If you don't know it, the premise is that uh, a man... Uh, or someone walks uh, uh, along a beach, and as they're walking along a beach um, in the sand, they're seeing various scenes of their life play by. And when they get to the end of their life, um, they, they say to God, and they look back uh, over their life, and they see two, two pairs of footprints in the sand where they've walked with God their whole life. But they notice that in the difficult and dark times of their life, there's only one pair of footprints. And they say, God... In the darkest moments of my life, why did you abandon me? Why did you let me walk those moments by myself? And God says to the person, no, 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 no. In those moments, that's when I carried you. That's when there's only one footprint in the sand because I was carrying you. That's a nice poem, isn't it? But I actually want to say it's wrong. (laughs) When you look back over the course of your life, you will only see one pair of footprints in your life. There is only one pair of footprints in the sand. 
And that's what God is saying to you here. Because from the moment you were conceived, God was carrying you. The, the word born here is actually the word womb. So it's, it's like it's saying from, from, from the moment that you were in the womb, I have carried you. You haven't walked by yourself without me. I have carried you. The ESV puts it really beautifully. It says, uh, you who have been born, my, born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Before you belonged to your parents, you belonged to God. And he carried you. I mean, something Kerry says often about Elodie, our new baby girl, is I didn't make that. <laughs> I didn't make her. People say, well done. Congratulations, girl. Amazing. You did it. You did it. And Kerry's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> God knit her together in my womb. I just sat here and ate popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Labor is not just sitting there and eating popcorn. But God made her, and that's what God says here. He said, I made you. I made you. It's an amazing warmth that God shows here in this passage. Listen to me, he says. You whom I have upheld since your birth, since carried since you were born. It's so fatherly, isn't it? It's so, I, I made you, I love you, I formed you, I'm the one who carries you. I've carried you. And it's also to the day you die. It says, even to your old age and gray hairs. And the implication there is not just to old age and gray hairs and then God drops you, but even through and into death. God will carry you through death. You know, we change through life. We, we're born, we grow older, we die. God doesn't change. He carries us from the moment we're in the womb all the way to our death. So when we look back, we will see one pair of footprints, the Lord's, as he's carried us. I am he who sustains you. I think sometimes we think of God as being up there and we're walking along and something bad happens. So we say, Lord, come and help. But actually, he's the one who sustains us. He's the one who, who, is, who has given us the breath in our lungs at this very moment. That is not just something that God has put into motion and let, lets you get on with. But he has given you that breath in your lungs, that beating of your heart, the food in your bellies, uh, everything, the clothes on your back. Everything is given to us by God. He has sustained us. We're like Frodo. I was imagining this. We're like Frodo. If you know the scene, we're, we're being carried up the mountain by Samwise Gamgee. We're weak. We can't do it on our own. But Sam, who loves Frodo, picks him up and carries him. That's what the Lord does for us. Even our salvation is achieved through God carrying our sins on himself. Um, he says at the end, uh, at the end there, um, I will sustain you and I will rescue you. I have made you, I will carry you, I will sustain you, I will rescue you. Turn a few pages with me to Isaiah 53. Just flick a few pages on to, to page 741 in the church Bible. Isaiah 53. And then uh, look from verse 4. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then look at verse 12. Do I mean verse 12? I don't mean verse 12. Yeah, I do, right at the end. Right at the end of verse 12. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. We sing a song here. We, say, we sing all our sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. <laughs> it's a song that we sing. And he didn't look at us and say, I'll, I'll carry you, but I won't carry that. I'll carry you, but I won't carry your sufferings. I'll carry you, but I won't carry your, your rebellion and your idolatry. The weight of Jesus picking us up and carrying us was the weight of the cross on the back of Jesus. The ESV uh, says, I have made and I will bear, I will carry and I will save. What an amazing picture that is of God carrying our sins on his back. 
There's much more to this than just I'm going to carry you through life. It's I will bear your sins myself. I will pay for that sin. I will carry it. I will save. And so listen, God says. Where does satisfaction come from, Ben? Where does happiness come from? Where does salvation come from? Not from idols that are just going to crush you and make you weary, but from God who made you, who's a father, who loves you, who is carrying you, who has carried you, by the way, whether you knew it or not, all the way to today, and is going to carry on carrying you through life, even to death. And so the question is, what idol is crushing you at the moment? What idol is a burden on you? What are you carrying every day that's heavy? What burden do you have in your life? Well, come to back to Jesus, who was crushed for our iniquity, who bore your sin. It's amazing. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So listen, God carries you. That's the first point. The second point, remember God has a plan. You can just click uh, the slide on, Dan. God has a plan. Uh, look at verse, so if you go back to um, Isaiah 46. And look at verse 8. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. And here again, God is contrasting himself with the idols of Babylon. Because remember, Bel and Nebu together were the gods of destiny and order. And so you would pray to them if you wanted your crops to grow or your children uh, to be well and healthy. If you wanted to change the, the course of your life and alter the future... You prayed to them. Your plans were in their hands. They were idols of control. You know, and nowadays it might be, I want a nice house. I want, you know, kids. I want good health. I want a stable income and job. I want friends that don't move away. And to that, to our desire for control, God says, remember the former things. I am God and there is no other. He says, I am El. And there is no other. You shall have no other gods before me. That's what we think of. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember. Remember what God has given his people, the commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. There is no other. Stop looking for idols. Stop thinking Bell will make your crops grow. He won't. There is no other God beside me. And then he says it again. It's interesting. God is punctuating this. But the second time, he doesn't say, I am El. He says, I am Elohim, which is the plural for El. And it's actually the word used in Genesis 1. So we're we're thinking back to um, Genesis, the maker of heaven and earth. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created. So, you know, remember who you're dealing with, in other words, is what God is saying. Remember who I am. The God, the only God, the plural unity, the maker of heaven and earth. Your future is not in your hands. Your future is not in the hands of an idol. It's in the hands of the one who made you. And who loves you and who made all things. Look at verse 10. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times what is still to come. Now how is it that God can make known the end from the beginning? Is it just because he can see the end? So he, you know, God is outside of time. He sees every moment as a present moment. Is it just that God sees the end and says I'm going to make that end known? Or is it more than that? Is it because he's shaping the future? You see how confident God is with the future. Look at the second half of verse 10. He says, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. God has a purpose. He has a plan. And he does that which pleases him. Verse 11b, look at the second half of verse 11. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. So, you know, go ahead and pray all you want to an idol. Go ahead and work as hard as you can in this life to control various parts of your life and elements. And what you will find is that God is the only one who does as he pleases. God is the one with the plan. And he gives an example of it. He gives an example. Very illustrative, God. He gives an example in verse 11. 
From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. Now that's talking about um, Cyrus. We learn about him in, in the earlier chapter 45. Cyrus was the leader of the rising Persian Empire. Um, and what God is doing is summoning that empire from a far off land to come and invade Babylon and to bring judgment against them for what they've done to God's people. And, um, you know, it says, I summon a bird of prey. Birds of prey circle, don't they? They're up in the air, they're circling because they see a corpse or they see a wounded animal that's about to die. And so they're circling above. They know that there's blood and they're going to feast soon. And so that's what Babylon is. Babylon, this great epic empire nation on earth, as, as grandiose as it thinks it is, as unsort of shakeable as it believes that it is, as confident as it is that it is the way and the salvation, it's just a corpse, really. And God is going to bring judgment upon it. And the gods of Babylon themselves are going to be carried off into exile when Persia invades. That, we saw that in verse 2. If you look up at verse 2, the, the Bel and Nebo, they stoop down. They bow down together. They're unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. And so God is displaying to us, whatever idols you have, they themselves are going to be brought under judgment and carried away. <laughs> even your gods, not just the, the people, but even the gods of the people are going to be carried away. Bel is not Lord. You see how clearly God is showing us this. Bel is not Lord. Nebu is not the word. But here is a God with a plan to save his people from captivity. And he's disclosing this plan to them. He's, he's proving this point, God. He's saying, I make known the end from the beginning. And here's an example. In about 100 years time, I'm going to raise up a bird of prey to come. And he's going to deliver Israel from captivity in Babylon. And that's exactly what happens. So here is an example of where God is not predicting the future, but saying, this is my plan. It will happen. And it did happen. Verse five again, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? God says, God is the one with the plan. But what about when you don't like God's plan? <laughs> I've spoken to someone once, you know, and, and, They've gone through a tough time in their life and you say, well, you know, Lord, the Lord has a plan. He's, he's working things out for your good. And they say, yeah, well, I don't like God's plan. <laughs> I don't like this thing that's happened. I have a complaint to make against God's plan. If you've ever asked that, then the last point uh, is another listen. God saves. God saves. In verse 8, God is speaking to rebels. He says, listen, you rebels. In verse 12, he speaks to the stubborn hearted who are far from his righteousness. You rebels, listen, you rebels. Listen, you stubborn hearted. That's pretty much the summary of the, the Old Testament, God's people in the Old Testament. They're rebels, they're stubborn hearted, they're sinners, they constantly turn to idols. It's amazing. As soon as God saves his people from Egypt, they're in the wilderness and they wish they were back in Egypt. <laughs> they miss the cucumbers, they miss the way things used to be, even though God saved them from it. How quickly they turn. They're rebels. They're stubborn hearted. Now, that summary from God, you rebels, you stubborn hearted, it's quite a scary summary <laughs> given what God has just reminded us about himself. He's just reminded us that he is the only God, the maker of all things. He's reminded us that he has a plan and whatever he says goes. And he's reminded us that he's carried us our entire lives, even when we've neglected that. But what God shows us here is though we are rebels and though we are stubborn, his plan for us, however it's being worked out in our lives, through joys, through sufferings, it's to bring his righteousness near to those who are far from it. So look at verse 12. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. I mean, imagine what God could say after that sentence. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. Sounds like he's about to bring the hammer down in judgment, doesn't it? Verse 13, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away. My salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. I will. Grant my salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. And now in the short term, in the context of what's going on here, 
that salvation is, is uh, Cyrus uh, and the Persian Empire coming to uh, invade Babylon and free God's people from captivity. That's the short term. My salvation will not be delayed, God says. And he does bring that salvation in history. Persian Empire comes, invades Babylon, and God's people go free back to, back to Israel. But in the long term, what God is doing is ultimately summoning a man from a far off land, not just Cyrus, but a man to fulfill his great purpose, who's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a man from a far off land (laughs) coming to fulfill his great purpose. And the great purpose is this. The father is summoning this man to carry our sin to the cross. That heavy load that Jesus bore on his back And Jesus is going to pay the penalty for our rebellion, for our stubbornness, for all of those cracks that appear in our heart when pressure is put on us. And we see them, we say, oh, I'm so ugly. I can't believe that's still a crack in my heart. Jesus takes all of that upon the cross and he pays the penalty for it. And he brings his righteousness to us. That's an amazing line. This is so good news. This is such good news for me, personally. Because as as pressure comes and LED exposes the cracks in my heart, the the good news is this. Jesus has paid for that idolatry. So when I'm sat there going, oh, I've laid my life down enough. I see how rebellious I am. Jesus has paid for that rebellion, that stubbornness of heart. But also, God has granted salvation to me. Not because I don't have any cracks in my heart, but precisely because I do have cracks in my heart. He has brought his salvation near to me. He's brought his salvation near to me. Because do you see who's doing the work of salvation here? God says, I am bringing my righteousness near. Ben, you're not going to have to go to my righteousness. I'm going to bring it near. It's not far away. My salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. God is the one who does it. He's the one who brings righteousness near to me. He takes, he carries my sin on the cross in Jesus and he brings his righteousness near to me. That's good news for me when I see the cracks in my heart. And the result of this salvation is the splendor, amazing line to finish on. I will grant my salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. That word is, it means beauty, m- glory. Um, my, my Spanish granddad used to say the best thing about the glory of God is the God of glory. (laughs) The best thing about the glory of God, God is going to grant his splendor to us. He's going to grant his glory to us. What's the best thing about God's glory? It's God. He's the best thing about his glory. And so that's what God is going to grant us. Not just forgiveness of sins and and an eternal life to live, but he's going to give us himself. Us who were rebellious and stubborn hearted, he's going to give us himself. And so if you're looking around your life going, hmm, I'm not sure what God's doing here. <laughs> I'm not sure what the plan is here, God. What is the plan here? If that's you, the plan of God is to grant you salvation through faith in his son and to carry you through the joys and sorrows of this life to make you ready to receive him and his glory and his splendor and his beauty. That is what God is doing. That's his plan. However, that's being worked out in your life. That is the plan. Let me just um, finish by saying, uh, reflecting on this line where God says, I am bringing my righteousness near, it is not far away. Um, In the context of Isaiah 46, when God says, my righteousness is near, it's not far away. He meant, I'm bringing uh, this Persian empire to invade and to free. It's not physically far away. It's not that long away. That's what he meant then. But this idea of, of God's righteousness not being far away now um, uh, is, is different for us here and today. Acts chapter 17 says this, God is not far from any one of us. God is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And so the distance between us and God's righteousness isn't time. So if you're thinking, oh, God will save me at some point in the future, or if you, it, God's righteousness is not uh, far away from us in the sense of, Um, I have to do lots to attain it. The distance between God's righteousness and us is faith now. So when God says, my righteousness is not far away, the distance is faith. And so the question for us is, do we trust him with our lives? Do we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
So will you trust him with your life? And will you join me in turning from the idols of our hearts, <laughs> laying down our lives truly, asking God to change our hearts, that we would love him? And will you join me in following the Lord Jesus Christ, who doesn't crush us, but he himself was crushed. And he invites us up to see the glory of God and to know God himself uh, in his face, to see him. And so these are the three points I wanted to share. He carries us, he's got a plan, and he saves. Let's pray. Let's thank the the Lord uh, for these things. Father, we thank you that you've spoken to us um, through your word. We thank you that you show us clearly that idols will never satisfy us or save us. Um, And Lord, yet so many times we we follow them and we we think they will satisfy us. We thank you that you show us and you say, listen. (laughs) Thank you that you've got us to listen. Help us to remember that you are the God with the plan. Thank you that that plan is salvation and it's glory. And Father, I pray for us that we would hear these words, that you are the God who saves, as we've been singing, that you are the God who, in all of our sufferings and difficulties, are the one who's taking us uh, from this life to the next uh, to see your splendor. Father, thank you that you are the one who is in control. And I pray that you would work these things into our hearts, that we would follow you and trust you and have faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, And we ask this in his name. Amen.